you may well wonder why there is a small domestic scaled fireplace here in this massive courthouse. I don't know either, but I have an idea. You see, when the building was originally opened, there were six courtrooms, four on the second floor, two on the fourth, fourth floor, and on the other end of the fourth floor were these two courtroom-sized rooms that were called the library. The reason for that is that what law and the practice of law were young in Dallas. All of the lawyers had their offices surrounding the courthouse here, but they they were young, they were poor, they didn't have a lot of books, so they had a communal library here in this room. And it's also where the nascent Bar Association would have met. So we don't know when these fireplaces were put in, but I like to picture one of those young attorneys who would someday found, say, Thompson and Knight, sitting in a wing chair next to this fireplace, reading a heavy and probably quite dreary tome about how you should practice law, about all the cases that they needed to understand so that they could really do a good job here at the Dallas County Courthouse. This very large space was at one point broken up into two separate courtrooms, but when the restoration occurred, they made one large space, which is also used for rentals. Usually this is where the receptions happen, and here are some pictures of what some of the people who've enjoyed having their wedding here have done to decorate this space. You can imagine once night falls, all the windows show the many lights of Dallas out there twi twinkling. I suppose when the lawyers were sitting by the fireplace, there weren't so many lights twinkling, but I imagine they still had a great view. Our next speaker is a native of Minnesota, Renee Schmidt. He came to Dallas to pursue graduate studies at SMU and the University of North Texas, where he received master's degrees in organ and harpsichord and a PhD in musicology. He teaches at the Dealey Academy in Dallas and is the organist choir director at Christ Episcopal Church. An ardent preservationist, he led the drive for the creation of the Junius Heights Historic District, and he's constantly restoring his 104-year-old house. He has a ferocious attack dog, five pounds of Yorkshire Terrier named Joe Blazer. He's adorable. So is Renee. In 2009, he presented Road to Glory, Dallas's 10th Street becomes Church Street. Today his topic is Murder It Was, the deaths of two women that shocked Dallas in the 1910s. Thank you, Evelyn. The body of Mrs. Hugh Perry, Alice as she was known to her friends, was discovered in a lonely ravine in Trinity Heights by two boys hunting rabbits on Thanksgiving morning, November 1915. Her body was laid out peacefully and there was no sign of a struggle. Her arms were folded across her chest and she was wearing the same clothes she had on when she disappeared 10 days earlier. She was dressed in a dark tailored suit, wearing the black turban hat she had purchased downtown on that fateful day. One of her stockings was worn inside out, the same mismatch that was noticed the last time she was seen alive. Next to her body was the bag of pecans that she bought that day. At her feet was a pair of lady slippers, one still dangling from her foot. The police were baffled. There was no sign of a struggle. Sheriff Reynolds believed it was murder. Lieutenant Detective Charles Gunning thought differently, and he saw no sign of foul play. The police ordered her stomach, liver, and kidneys removed to check for poisons. Was it a murder, or was it suicide? Alice's aunt, Mrs. Paget, admitted that her niece had been particularly nervous of lately. A neighbor recalled that Alice had not seemed to be altogether like herself but blamed it on the last storm in Galveston. But no, suicide was out of the question. Mrs. Garner, her close friend of 23 years, said that Alice called her up on the day she disappeared and invited her to go shopping with her downtown. Mrs. Garner recalled, she was as bright and cheerful as she could be. Alice's sister-in-law, Mrs. W. Perry, likewise scoffed at the suicide theory. She shared a letter that Alice had mailed the day she disappeared. It was filled with the happy thoughts of a shopping trip downtown. I haven't bought any new clothes yet, she wrote. I've been waiting till after the fair. Mamie and I are going downtown today. 
It does no harm to look. Mrs. Hugh Perry, Alice, 45 years of age, was last seen on November 15th, 1915, when she went on that shopping trip downtown with her sister, Mrs. Royal Smith. Alice lived at North Ewing Avenue in Oak Cliff and probably caught the streetcar that ran down Jefferson Avenue close to her home. Here's a map that shows the route of the Jefferson Avenue streetcar. The red dot indicates the apartment where Mrs. Perry lived. While downtown, she bought a small black turban hat and a bag of pecans. At 2.30, she excused herself, claiming she had an appointment to meet somebody. Seven witnesses recalled seeing her on Elm Street an hour later. That was the last time she was seen alive. Who she was to meet was never known. Her husband reported her missing the next day. When she'd been gone 10 days later and, and found in that ravine in the Trinity River, by the Trinity River, the authorities estimated she had been dead for two days. Analysis of her stomach showed it was empty. She hadn't eaten for some time. Where had she been? What had she done? Police eventually concurred that a robbery and a murder had taken place, especially when Dr. Lomas found a two-inch blood clot on her brain. He theorized that it was a quick strangulation. Police later speculated that the purse, the pecans, as well as the watch and the diamond ear screw may have been left by the killer to make it look like a suicide. Alice was wearing a lot of expensive jewels the day she disappeared. When her body was discovered, most of the gems were gone. A diamond rings, an ear screw, and a brooch. And this wasn't costume jewelry. It was worth about $500 in 1915 currency, or about $10,000 today. She was still wearing a watch with a diamond-studded monogram, but that was concealed beneath her clothing, so a thief could have missed it. A small purse containing $1.20, about $25 in today's money, was at her side. Around her neck were two handkerchiefs with an embroidered T. In her purse was a smaller handkerchief, also with a T on it. The significance of the T was never established. The face was scratched and there was a bruise over her left eye. Based on the soil samples on her shoes, police concluded she may have walked over to Trinity Heights to meet somebody in that lonely destination. A motorman for the Trinity Heights streetcar, Mr. Phillips, told authorities that he saw a woman, meaning the description to a degree of Mrs. Hughes, get off his streetcar between the Santa Fe and the Cedar Bridges. On Tuesday, the last day she, after she was seen downtown, he noticed all the jewels that she had on, and he warned her not to get off at that location. She was insistent, however. When he was asked to identify the body, he could not say for certain that it was Mrs. Hughes. The motorman and a conductor of the Waco Inner Urban Herb Line recalled picking up a woman Monday who matched Alice's general description in Waxahachie on the route to Dallas. They remembered her as being very nervous. She got off at the Monroe stop to catch the Trinity Heights car. When they were asked to identify the body, they likewise weren't quite certain. There were two shadowy letters that added drama to the case. An anonymous letter sent to the police in February 1916 promised that if a certain chauffeur were questioned, he could tell them about the murder. That turned out to be a false clue. In April of 1916, a letter was discovered between, behind the controller box of the streetcar. It advised him if they contacted a certain woman, she could lead them to the killer. 
that also didn't pan out. Alice was an active parishioner at Christ Church Episcopal, then located on the top of the hill, close to the business center of Oak Cliff. A member of the church, Dorothy Fry, wrote in her diary on November 25, 1915, Mrs. Hugh Perry, who goes to our church, disappeared 10 days ago, and today she was found strangled to death on a creek way out in Trinity Heights. Alice's funeral took place on November 29, 1915. An anonymous reporter visited the church that Sunday morning and took copious notes. These are some of the observations. The tragedy of Mrs. Perry's death, which envelops the whole city, is especially poignant at Christ Church. The congregation discussed it in little groups before the sermon, and Reverend Whaling, first words, recalled it. Reverend Whaling is tall, with curly gray hair and an expressive face. His voice is vibrant, though a bit nervous in his delivery, and he carries the impression of intense earnestness and complete conviction. He gestures freely and vigorously. Then came the order of service for communion. During this part of the liturgy, the priest chants the Ten Commandments. Between them, the congregation sings, Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep this law. A solemn hush came over the congregation when Reverend Whaling, in a voice tense and vibrant, chanted the sixth commandment, Thou shalt do no murder. Mrs. Perry's funeral followed that afternoon at 4 o'clock at the church. That was Reverend, one of Reverend Whaling's last official acts at Christ Church. She was buried in the Oak Cliff Cemetery. Police speculated that the case of Mrs. Hugh Perry would end up like that of Florence Brown, a sensational unsolved murder that occurred two years earlier. And who was Florence Brown? In 1953, 40 years after her murder in 1913, the Dallas Morning News began a new Sunday feature page that promised to, quote, crackle with excitement, end quote. The opening installment featured the famous unsolved murder of Florence Brown. But who really was Florence Brown? She was an active member of the McKinney Avenue Baptist Church and was an energetic participant in circles and aid societies of that church. She was also on the business girls team of the YMCA, where it was thought she would participate on Sundays for club purposes such as, quote, writing, singing, receiving friends, and the use of the stereopticon for educational and amusement intent, end quote. She was the woman who made appearances at dinner parties graced with hand-painted place cards at church-sponsored moonlight picnics and lawn socials, socials. Never a bride, she was the willing personality who helped others celebrate life's milestones, serving refreshments after weddings, hosting bridal dinners, or by being the official bridal toast mistress. Her crowning public achievement seems to be a stock speech. She delivered 19 days before her death at the YMCA on, quote, what the club means to me, end quote. In short, Florence Brown led a quiet, productive, yet unremarkable life. That is, until the day she was murdered. Florence Brown woke the Monday morning of July 28, 1913, to a Dallas that promised temperatures in the upper 90s. That, along with the weekend thunderstorms that dumped an inch of rain on Dallas, must have made the air particularly sultry. The previous day, Sunday, being a handmaiding of her beloved McKinney Avenue Baptist Church, she attended services there and sang in the choir. The church had completed a major renovation three months earlier and was one of Dallas's early megachurches. 
It seated more than a thousand people with its soaring three stories and featured imposing columns. It would host her funeral four days later. On that fateful Monday morning in 1913, she was picked up for work by Mr. Cuthbertson. They both worked at her uncle's business of Robinson and Skyrun, a real estate firm on Field Street where he was the salesman and she was the secretary. Her uncle, Jeff Robinson, was on vacation and requested that Mr. Cuthbertson give her a ride to work in the company-owned car in his absence. He picked her up from her home on Cedar Springs, where she lived with her parents, at six minutes before eight. Her father, a policeman who had a beat downtown, declined the offer to ride with them, stating that, I was sitting on my front porch, enjoying my pipe and reading the Dallas News. As I had 10 minutes before to go, I declined the invitation, telling them I would go down on the streetcar. Florence waved her hand to me, and I waved back. That was the last time he saw her alive. Florence Brown and Mr. Cuthbertson reached the office around 8.10. He did his duty, unlocked the front doors, turned on the light switches, then told Florence he would be back in 30 to 40 minutes. He had some business to do at the city hall and the courthouse. He returned 45 minutes later. The firm's partner and an employee walked in. The employee, Mr. Swore, went to the vault room and made the gruesome discovery. He said, I raised Miss Brown up from the floor where she was lying and saw that her face was covered with blood and that her hair was disheveled and her clothing torn. I called out to Mr. Styron, for heaven's sake, come here quick. Miss Florence has either cut herself or has been cut. Colberthen ran to find a doctor and soon returned with Dr. Harden, who declared that Miss Brown had been dead for about 15 minutes. She had been beaten on the head with a blunt instrument and her throat had been slit. Her right hand was cut to the bone and her clothing torn. Curiously, there was a bite mark on her right hand. Two bystanders later claimed they heard a muffled scream from a woman as if in terror or surprise around 9.30 or 9.35. The murderer, murderer washed his hands in the sink, took the murder wep weapon with him, and calmly left the building and disappeared into the busy morning rush hour. The next day, the Morning News published sensational interior pictures of the office where Florence Brown was murdered. The first picture used an arrow to highlight the bloody wash basin where the killer washed his hands. The next, the placid and well-appointed office where Florence breathed her last. The third photo featured the door from the main office to the private office where the murder took place. Finally, a star pinpointed where the body was found. Her funeral took place at McKinney Avenue Baptist Church on July 31st, 1913. Despite the oppressive heat, more than a thousand people crammed into the sanctuary. There were so many flowers that a second wagon was needed to deliver them to the Oakland Cemetery. A murder needs a motive. Either it is robbery or some other cause that motivates the criminal to kill. Robbery was quickly ruled out. Florence Brown did have the combination to the safe, and when it was opened two days later, nothing was missing. A dragnet was thrown around North Texas, but the police had no idea of who or what they were looking for. All southbound trains and all cars were searched, and Waxahachie police watched dirt roads leading into the city. The sheriff of Sherman notified his men to keep an eye on suspicious characters, with the result that many innocent people were picked up on dubious charges. 
The governor of Texas offered a reward of $250. Dallas Sheriff added $150, which made it $400, about $10,000, leading to the reward and capture of the criminal. The day after the murder, Chief Detective Tanner stated he knew less than he did 24 hours earlier. As he said, it might have been robbery, and it might have been something worse, which prompted the cruel attack upon Florence Brown. I'm rather inclined to think it was not robbery. It is quite apparent she was taken by surprise in the toilet room. The deed may have been committed by one who knew her, or it may have been the work of some demented person. For days, every available person in the Dallas Police Department worked on the case. Detectives went to Brownwood, Sherman, and San Antonio. The clues went nowhere. When Florence's uncle, Mr. Robinson, returned from Colorado, he was confident he knew who murdered his niece. He publicly declined to state his sus suspicions because the investigations were ongoing. The police were also tight-lipped. We will never know who Mr. Robinson suspected. There was a marriage license issued on February 20th, 1912 to a T.H. Hinkle and a Florence Brown. Apparently, this marriage never happened. Was this the stilted lover? The clue that Mr. Robinson refused to publicly express? The police speculated that Miss Brown had been affronted she resented it, and she was murdered to hide the insult that would, so that would never be discovered. On August 7th, the case seemed to break. A peddler found a knife with blood on it. The blade had a fingerprint on it. Maybe the assailant was a woman because of the fingerprint nail marks on Florence's throat and hands, her messed up hair, a missing ring, and the tooth marks on her right hand, which were perhaps, quote, symbolic of the tactics generally used by women in personal encounters, end quote. The knife was a red herring. No arrests were made. Eventually, several suspects floated to the surface. Mead Barr was a prisoner in the Indiana Reformatory and claimed to have done the deed. When he testified in front of a grand jury on November 1st, 1913, reporters observed a woman crying bitterly in the witness room. Both were charged with the crime. The woman's name was Mrs. Ellie Lake. She lived in an apartment complex on South Haskell where Mead Barr was a frequent visitor. She announced her interest in Mead Bar was only to get him to stop drinking. She also insisted she had rejected his advances and had told him never to come around unless her husband was present. She was eventually released, and so was Mead Bar. Mead Bar was returned to the Indiana Penitentiary. He had been bored in prison, wrote a fake confession and implicated his one-to-be lover, Mrs. Lake, for revenge. About a year after Florence's murder, another suspect emerged. An elderly woman came to the police and claimed that her son, Sean Fennell, had murdered five people, threatened her, and told her he was the killer. According to the tale, she and her son got out on the streetcar to downtown the morning of the killing. She leased a house from Miss Brown's uncle and gave Shad the money to pay the rent at the office where Miss Brown worked. Shad was reported to later have said, they never will find out who the killer was, is. Shad was later found living by the state fairgrounds. Police surrounded the house on February 21st, 1915, and they had a shootout. Shad was killed, and Lieutenant Gunning was shot in the hand and had to have two fingers amputated on his left hand. 
Dr. Cheney, the dentist who made plaster casts of the teeth, marks on Florence's arms, declared that Chad was not the murderer. The plaster teeth cast showed an individual who had no tooth on the upper right side. Chad had a tooth missing on the upper left side. Therefore, he could not have been the murderer. Detective Tanner disagreed and felt they had gotten their man. An investigation by the grand jury found no credible evidence that Chad Fennell was the murderer. The police continued to look for suspects. Four years after the murder, on July 30th, 1917, a man named Felix Jones was charged with the killing of Florence Brown. He was being held on, in the El Paso jail awaiting trial for the murder of Thomas Lyons, a wealthy cattleman. A woman claimed to have been in the office the morning Miss Brown was killed. There was a raging stranger, possibly Mr. Jones, who was in the office. When she was asked to go to El Paso to identify Mr. Jones, she refused because of her poor health. Eventually, in September 1918, the case was dismissed for lack of evidence. Parades of clues kept coming in, mainly from convicted criminals jaded by jail time and looking for notoriety. A convict in the Texas penitentiary announced he had slain her to cover up questionable real estate transactions in Oklahoma. Another in Huntsville, Alabama, proclaimed that he was Florence's sweetheart. He had witnessed the killer killing, but was silent all these years because he had been threatened with a revolver. As in a Shakespearean play, the drama intensified as the sagas continued. Lady Justice, however, refused to display her virtues. Despite the police's best efforts, the killers of Mrs. Hugh Perry and Miss Florence Brown were never found or identified. All the people once involved are now on the other side of eternity. Their names and lives are largely forgotten today. But the question remains, who murdered Mrs. Hugh Perry and Miss Florence Brown? The answers are elusive and remain as one of Dallas's great unsolved murder mysteries. Thank you. Now we're in a former courtroom on the fourth floor, which we call the Restoration Room. It's a little ironic because the restoration is not complete in this room. It is left slightly undone so that people can get a better idea of the underlying construction of the building. We do a lot of wedding ceremonies here in this room, and sometimes the brides will ask, will it be finished before my wedding? The answer is no. No, it will never be finished. It will look exactly like this during your wedding ceremony. Among the things you can see because we've done this are the brick walls that are underneath the plaster. There's the plaster on the edge. The outside of the building is stone. Stone is expensive. Brick is cheaper. And why would you want to pay the extra money for stone on that middle layer, which was going to be covered with plaster anyway? They couldn't predict that at some point in the future, we'd leave it uncovered and enjoy the looks of the brick. This room is for teaching, and it also is a fine place to hold a wedding ceremony. If those brides think this room looks a little rough now, they should have seen it during restoration. They naturally began by removing everything that had been put in since it was built and taking all the plaster off so that you can see the brick all over the place. You can even see some of the structure revealed, which by now has been covered up. Our next speaker is Teresa Musgrove, a third generation Dallasite and proud Woodrow Wilson Wildcat. She received a Bachelor's of Business Administration degree in Accounting and a Master's of Library Information Services from UT Austin. She's employed in financial aid accounting with the Dallas College. She's also a member of all the leading Dallas cultural organizations. She's currently working on a book about the history of the Lakewood Shopping Center, and she hopes that it will be completed and published in 2025. She spoke to us in 2019 on J.L. Long, bringing Dallas schools into the 20th century. And today she will share the story of 
Horror in Hollywood Heights, about a murder and trial in the late 1930s, which garnered national attention. It was a sweltering summer evening on July 25th, 1938, in the quiet Hollywood Heights neighborhood of East Dallas. Most of the Tudor-style homes had their windows raised high to create a cooling cross-ventilation in this era before air conditioning. As night fell, porch lights shined yellow here and there down the street. Neighbors visiting on front porches said their goodbyes and slammed screen doors behind them. Children fell asleep in their beds, listening to the buzzing songs of the locusts in the trees. Of particular attention was a duplex at 404-406 Monte Vista Drive, the second house from the end of the street near Santa Fe Avenue. Downtown beauty shop operators, Mr. and Mrs. Eric D. Napier lived in the 406 side, and Joseph Miller, a clerk at Texaco's downtown office, and his wife, Inez, resided in 404. Joseph's sister, 26-year-old teacher Mary Jo Miller, was visiting during her summer vacation. On this Monday night, Mary Jo had gone on a date with a college acquaintance. The two spent the evening enjoying dinner and dancing at the Century Room in the Adolphus Hotel. Around 1.30 in the morning, Mary Jo's friend brought her home, and she walked up the, ste the steps of the duplex, unlocked the front door, and closed it behind her. She heard the young man drive away and she began preparing to sleep on the extra mattress in the front room. As she hung up her dress, she heard a noise outside the living room window. She turned quickly as a large suitcase sailed through the open window and landed on the floor with a thump. Frightened, Mary Jo ran to the back of the duplex to waken Joseph. Brother, she screamed, come see what this is in the front room. As Joseph stood up, a deafening blast rocked the house. A piece of ceiling hit him on the head, knocking him to the floor. Mary Jo also fell to the floor, and Inez, still in bed, avoided getting hit by the airborne boards and bricks of the house. The entire front room where Mary Jo had stood moments before was completely leveled, her mattress blown to tattered bits. The Napier's living room in the adjoining side of the duplex was also demolished, but both of them escaped harm. The only Hollywood resident to sustain injuries was next door neighbor, Mrs. W.S. Sanders at 402 Monte Vista, who received a concussion when she was hit by bricks flying through her bedroom window. Airborne debris shattered windows in other houses up and down the street. The explosion was heard as far away as Fair Park. Police detectives estimated that 20 to 40 sticks of dynamite were used in the blast. A week later, after the police and insurance companies had completed their investigations, the bombed duplex was leveled to the ground. Twelve hours after the blast, Nacogdoches County deputy sheriffs, acting on a tip from Dallas police detectives, arrested 35-year-old Edgar Ross Wyatt in connection with the bombing of the Monte Vista duplex. A dynamite cap was found in Wyatt's car during a search by the Nacogdoches deputies. After learning of the arrest, three Dallas police detectives drove to Nacogdoches and took custody of Wyatt, bringing him to the Dallas jail that Tuesday evening. Wyatt, a tall man with graying hair, calmly stood as reporters asked questions. He stated that he had not been in Dallas for over a year and refused to talk about the bombing. Afterwards, Wyatt asked if he could comb his hair before posing for a jail photo taken by a Dallas Morning News photographer. During the next several days, a dramatic narrative unfolded in Dallas newspapers concerning Wyatt, the only suspect in the Hollywood Heights bombing, and Mary Jo Miller, the presumed target of the bombing. Who were the principal characters in this sensational story? Edgar Ross Wyatt, a native of San Augustine, Texas, was born in 1902. He studied education at Stephen F. Austin State College and received teaching certifications from the University of Texas and the Peabody College in Tennessee. In July 1922, he married fellow school teacher Leela Davidson. Their daughter Dorothy was born in 1926. Wyatt taught school and athletics in several small East Texas communities. In 1931, he began a term as principal of the Brooklyn School in Sabine County, located on the edge of the Sabine National Forest. 
In September 1931, a young teacher named Mary Jo Miller walked into the Brooklyn School seeking a position as a physical education teacher. Mary Jo, also a native of San Augustine, was born in 1912. She studied education at the State College for Women at Denton, and after graduation at the age of 19, returned to East Texas to seek employment. Wyatt was taken by the young woman's beauty and her bubbly personality. He hired her to teach and to be his secretary. After a few months, Wyatt and Miller began having an affair. Wyatt divorced his wife in 1933, opening the way for he and Miller to be more public with their relationship. The couple even traveled to Dallas together in 1936 to attend the Texas Centennial. But Miller disliked Wyatt's smothering attentions and searched for a teaching position farther away. In the summer of 1938, Wyatt was the principal-elect of the Appleby School in Appleby, Texas, a small community north of Nacogdoches. Mary Jo Miller told Dallas police detectives that when Wyatt learned that she had accepted a teaching position in Chicago, he became enraged that she was leaving Texas and him. She believed that Wyatt was responsible for the dynamiting of her brother's house. While Wyatt sat in the Dallas City Jail awaiting arraignment, he was visited by a trustee of the Appleby School. The trustee seized the school building's keys from Wyatt's possessions held by Dallas City Jail personnel and told a reporter as he left the building that Wyatt would no longer be employed at the school. On August 4th, 1938, Wyatt was arraigned and formally charged with burglary by explosives and nighttime burglary with bonds set at $50,000. His trial was set for the Monday after Thanksgiving, November 27, 1938. But the day before Thanksgiving, Wyatt was rushed to Parkland Hospital in serious conditions, suffering from pneumonia. The trial had to be postponed, and a new trial date was later set for April 3, 1939. That trial date was canceled due to continuances. On May 10, 1939, Wyatt posed for the Dallas Morning News with the caption, All dressed up and anxious to get out of jail on bond. Wyatt's attorneys filed suit to force Sheriff Smoot Schmidt to approve the now lower $25,000 bond for the prisoner's release. When asked by the, pre by the press why he denied the bond, Sheriff Schmidt said, I just turned it down, that's all. So Wyatt remained in jail until his next court date, now scheduled for June 19th. In preparation for the trial, Wyatt's defense attorneys, San Augustine's J.R. Bogard and Dallas's Albert Basquet, subpoenaed 63 defense witnesses to provide an alibi for Wyatt's whereabouts on July 25, 1938. However, several of the witnesses notified Judge Grover C. Adams that they could not afford the money for a trip to Dallas from East Texas. 33 of the witnesses did appear in court on June 18th, only to be turned away when the trial was postponed for the third time. The trial was scheduled for its fourth date on December 11th, 1939. Wyatt had been a resident of Dallas County Jail for 17 months. The charges had been upgraded to include burglary with explosives with intent to kill, and the state planned to ask the jury to sentence Wyatt to life in prison. A few days before the trial began, the state's star witness, Mary Jo Miller, contacted Dallas County District Attorney Andrew Patton, telling him that a man called her in Chicago several times asking how she was traveling to Dallas and threatening to prevent her travel. Patton arranged for Miller to fly from Chicago on a passenger plane under an assumed name, which was most unusual and quite expensive in that era of train travel. She stayed with her brother at the Jefferson Hotel near Union Station and the Old Red Courthouse. On Monday, December 11, 1939, a jury of 12 men were chosen. The trial was of national interest as newspaper reporters, photographers, and journalists from all over the country arrived to cover the sensational proceedings. Onlookers showed up early to claim seats in the courtroom each day, not wanting to miss a word of riveting testimony. During lunch breaks, viewers rushed outside to grab a sandwich from street vendors and ran back inside to reclaim their seats. On Tuesday, December 12, 1939, at 2 p.m., testimony began in Judge Grover C. Adams' courtroom with the state's first two witnesses, Hollywood Heights neighbors 
Herbert, Herbert Herndon and R.L. Sparkman, both of whom lived on Monte Vista Drive. Herndon testified that he saw Ross Wyatt at 8 p.m. the night of the bombing. Wyatt had parked his car on Monte Vista, and Herndon asked if he needed help. They chatted about the weather, and Wyatt drove away. Herndon identified a photo of the defendant's car as the one he saw that July night. Sparkman testified that he saw Wyatt's black coupe three times on July 25th, driving slowly up and down the street, and later parked on Santa Fe Avenue near the Miller home. He jotted down the license plate number because of the suspicious activity. Sparkman, however, could not identify the man he saw in the car. Joseph Miller next appeared on the witness stand. After describing the explosion that demolished his home, Miller told about his dislike of Wyatt. Miller warned his sister to stay away from the school teacher because Wyatt had been previously married and had a child. Miller also stated that Mary Jo and Wyatt had, quote, kept company for about five years. On Wednesday morning, District Attorney Patton called Mary Jo Miller to the stand. She testified that after Wyatt hired, to teach, hired her to teach at the Brooklyn School in 1931, he, quote, forced his attentions on her and threatened to kill any person who came between them. Miller and Wyatt taught at the same school for three years and then Mary Jo transferred to the Sabine School in 1934. Wyatt continued to call her and tried to see her every week. In 1937, Miller found a job in the Oak Grove suburb of Chicago in order to escape Wyatt's attentions. When Wyatt learned of her plans, Mil Miller testified, quote, I had told him I had been humiliated enough and that I would tell my brother about his attentions. He told me if I did, he'd shoot my brother between the eyes. Defense attorney J.R. Bogard then cross-examined Mary Jo, and in an attempt to disparage her character, he asked, After learning Wyatt was married and continuing to keep company with him, did you feel capable of teaching those young school children in the ways of right living? Mary Jo boldly replied, Listen, Mr. Bogard, I didn't go to Brooklyn as a Sunday school teacher, eliciting a roar from the courtroom spectators. Next, Bogard read excerpts from letters Miller had written to Wyatt in an effort to show that she was in love with the defendant. Quote, you are all my dreams come true. Did you write that? Asked Bogard. Yes, if it's in there, I guess I did, Mary Jo tearfully answered. But my dreams blew up. The next witness to testify was Richard Miles, an employee at the Lee Hardware Company in Shreveport, who identified Ross Wyatt as the purchaser of 100 sticks of dynamite in March 1938. Wyatt packed the explosives into two suitcases and a briefcase. Miles testified that Wyatt asked him what would happen if he stowed a suitcase beside a house. Miles replied, it would blow the house up. Next testimony heard by the jury that Wednesday included Sheriff H. M. Cook of Nacogdoches County, who removed the roll of dynamite fuse from Wyatt's car when the defendant was arrested. Ray Bonta, Miller's date the night of the bombing, also testified that he and Mary Jo attended North Texas State Teachers College in Denton in 1930, and their July date was the first time he had seen her in eight years. He said that he heard the explosion five minutes after leaving Mary Jo at the duplex. On Thursday, December 14th, nearly 40 defense witnesses took the stand, most attempting to provide an alibi for Ross Wyatt during the day and time of the explosion. The long parade of witnesses included Sybil Wyatt, Ross's sister-in-law, who testified using her daily diary from March 1938 as evidence that Wyatt was helping her wash clothes and could not have purchased dynamite in Shreveport that day. Sybil's sister, Lillian Jones, testified that she saw Wyatt in Hemphill, Texas, east of Lufkin, just two hours before the Dallas explosion. Rich Martin of Hemphill said that he saw and spoke to Wyatt about 10.30 p.m. the night of the bombing. Next, the trial took a dramatic turn when Ross Wyatt's ex-wife, Leela, took the stand. Leela Wyatt spoke about a confrontation she had with Miller in 1932, in which Leela accused Mary Jo of trying to steal her husband. 
Layla tearfully remembered saying to the younger woman, Mary Jo, you are a thief in that you have stolen the affections of my husband and a robber because you are robbing my child of a home. Friday began with Ross Wyatt taking the stand in his own defense. During his hour and a half testimony, Wyatt denied purchasing dynamite or setting the bomb, but did admit to his relationship with Mary Jo Miller. He stated that he was in East Texas on the day of the attack and that the dynamite fuse found in his car belonged to his deceased brother, the previous owner of the car. The Dallas Morning News' coverage of the trial did not contain any direct quotes from Wyatt. The Dallas Times Herald reported that, quote, Wyatt matched wits with District Attorney Andrew Patton. He appeared cocksure throughout and was smiling when he left the witness stand. National newspapers reported that Wyatt gave intimate details about his relationship with Miller, but the Dallas papers did not include any of this in their coverage. The Times Herald stated, the rest of his testimony is unprintable. After Wyatt left the stand, the defense rested. Then District Attorney Patton called a surprise witness to the stand. Esther McCown, owner of the Lakewood Pharmacy, a small drug store on Abrams Road in Lakewood Heights. Mrs. McCown testified that Wyatt came into her store on the afternoon of July 25th asking to use the phone. He telephoned four different numbers asking each time for the address of J.H. Miller. McCown then presented a charge slip on which Wyatt had written 404 Monte Vista. When asked why the defendant did not take the slip of paper when he left the store, McCown replied that she told Wyatt that he couldn't take that slip because it was a charge ticket. Wyatt then wrote the address on another piece of paper. When McCown saw Wyatt's photo in the newspaper, she recognized him and notified the police. The little charge slip became the state's most important piece of evidence as it also contained the date of the bombing, July 25, 1938. When McCown left the stand, it was 7 p.m. and the trial was continued to Saturday morning. On Saturday, December 16th, a packed courtroom listened to the closing arguments of defense attorney J.R. Bogard, who said that the state failed to establish a motive for the bombing and listed the state's circumstantial evidence. He was followed by District Attorney Patton, who presented his final remarks. The court recessed at 11.50 a.m. and the jury began its work. After five minutes of deliberations, the jury unanimously found Edgar Ross Wyatt guilty of all charges. The jury took a longer time to determine the sentence, going through five ballots, with some jurors in favor of a 10-year sentence and others preferring 99 years. They settled on a 50-year sentence and the courtroom was reconvened at 1.35 p.m. for the verdict. Wyatt showed little emotion when the verdict was read, and he was quickly escorted out of the courtroom and transported to jail. District Attorney Patton said, quote, the verdict reflects a response to the state's plea for justice and a penalty that would confirm the credibility of the state's witnesses and serve as an adequate punishment for this defendant's crime. Mary Jo Miller, who was not in court when the verdict was announced, told a Dallas Morning News reporter, I've been vindicated. Immediately following the trial, District Attorney Patton filed a motion to charge disbarred Dallas lawyer Orrin Permitter with contempt for intimidating Miller to prevent her from testifying. Permitter had offered Miller $500 to stay away from the trial because, quote, she would receive unpleasant publicity. On December 18th, two days after Wyatt's conviction, Orrin Parmiter was sentenced by Judge Adams to three days in jail with a $100 fine. Because the newspapers reported the intimidation of Miller before the trial began, Wyatt's defense attorneys filed an appeal for a new trial. However, on January 9th, 1941, the Court of Criminal Appeals overruled a motion for a retrial, and Ross Wyatt was transferred from the Dallas County Jail to Huntsville State Prison to serve his 50-year term. And what became of Mary Jo Miller? She returned to Oak Park, Illinois to teach physical education and history at the Oak Park and River Forest Township High School. 
On December 27, 1939, just 11 days after the end of the Wyatt trial, Mary Jo married fellow Oak Park teacher Gerald Considine in a small ceremony in Fairfield, Iowa. She continued to teach school in Oak Park and her photo appears in the high school's 1941 yearbook. Not long after this, Mary Jo left teaching to raise her son and daughter. She worked briefly for Sears in Chicago writing training manuals. When her children were school-aged, she went back to teaching, retiring from a Glenview, Illinois junior high school in 1972. She passed away in 2010 at the age of 97. Edgar Ross Wyatt began serving his 50-year prison sentence at the Huntsville State Prison in 1941. Records show that he should have been released on January 10, 1991. However, his sentence was commuted to 15 years, including the time served in Dallas County Jail. He was released from Huntsville on November 11, 1952. Wyatt returned to East Texas and lived and worked in Lufkin, although not as a teacher, but as a bookkeeper. On August 6, 1972, at the age of 70, Ross Wyatt remarried his ex-wife, Leela. They spent the rest of their lives together. Wyatt passed away at the age of 89 on Christmas Eve, 1991. Leela survived him and passed away at the age of 102 on the 4th of July, 1999. Ross and Leela are buried side by side in the Garden of Memories Cemetery in Lufkin. A happy ending to what began with a nighttime horror in a peaceful Dallas neighborhood. The word policeman means many things to many people. To the average citizen, it usually means traffic. It is most often on downtown street intersections at peak hours that the policeman is actively seen. You might even say looked out for. But traffic is only one phase of the work of the Dallas Police Department. The steady ebb and flow of every facet of Dallas business and family life moves smoothly and peacefully under the citywide shield of protection of the Dallas Police Department. The uniform and badge of your police officer is your guarantee of the protection of the law. The individual officer behind the badge makes the protection of your person and your property a reality wherever you work, wherever you live, every day of the year. Sometimes you see a squad car cruising a quiet neighborhood, a reassuring symbol of protection to a mother watching from a window or a small boy waving a friendly greeting. For these men in blue uniforms are keepers of the peace. Their presence and the fact that they could be just around the corner makes our neighborhoods peaceful. How many of you have ever found it necessary to call the police? The answer is very few. The reason is that the big job of your police department is prevention. When a city like Dallas is properly policed, unpleasant occurrences are held to a minimum. Major crime stories capture the headlines, but everyday police work is made up of a lot of little things. Things like this school patrol officer protecting young children from traffic hazards. Good police work is also unobtrusive. You seldom see more than one or two Dallas officers at one time. You would have to go very much out of your way to see this shift change. Yet the Dallas Police Department is made up of 952 officers and 129 civilian employees. Now you see them, now you don't. But whether you see them or not, 
Police protection is one of the prime requisites for the orderly conduct of Dallas business. Let's take banking. You hardly ever think of police officers when you think of banks conducting business, and yet hundreds of people walk in and drive in to our banks every day, making deposits and withdrawals of substantial sums of money. The modern day Sam Bass keeps pretty much out of the picture. He knows that police protection is always near, too near, to take a calculated risk. Yes, the banking business goes on quietly and orderly because bank robbing is a losing game, because the man behind the badge in the blue uniform is always available and ready for action. A lot of merchandise moves in and out of Dallas every day. Scenes like this are common on Dallas streets. No locked doors on trucks. How easy it would be to pick up a box and walk off. Or is it? A squad car might turn up the next minute. Or even if the thief got away, a chain police reaction would soon result in recovery of the merchandise. Dallas is also the transportation center of the Southwest and one of the most important crossroads of travel in the nation. That too creates multiple police problems. It also means a crossroads of travel for the underworld. Followers of TV detective shows will immediately recognize the line. Check all bus, railroad, and plane departures. Distance affords little protection to the modern day fugitive from justice. Modern communication systems link up Dallas with the major police departments of the nation, sending and receiving information on wanted men. An important arrest might be made right next to you at Love Field by a plainclothes man and you would never know it. A lot of unseen drama goes on every day at these terminals while you are exercising your freedom of movement. And this don't just happen. It must be protected. Private transportation on our highways and turnpikes is an even larger part of this freedom of movement. From this toll road to the west, Central Expressway to the northeast, and other major traffic arteries, thousands of cars roll in and out of Dallas every day. It is the job of your police department, your sheriff's department, and the state highway patrol to keep this traffic moving safely and smoothly. Generally speaking, the sheriff's patrol cars take over the police job at the city limits. They patrol the outer reaches of the 893 square miles of Dallas County. 16 of the 29 incorporated cities and towns in the county have no police department. Seven have less than eight men each. These smaller communities depend on the sheriff's department for support in emergencies and additional police power. Both the Dallas Police Department and the Sheriff's Department work closely with the Texas Department of Public Safety on traffic control and other matters. And don't forget, we have schools in the county too. Protecting their children is an additional chore for the Sheriff's Department. More than 35,000 people living in remote hamlets and isolated country homes in Dallas County depend on these gray and black mobile units for protection. Last year, 48 patrolmen working three shifts ran up a total of some two million miles on Dallas County roads. Even so, Dallas County is becoming less and less rural. Our major plants extend from Grand Prairie to Garland. In manufacturing employment alone, Almost 86,000 people in Dallas County 
go to and from work every day. These people are only a part of our overall non-farming employment of 386,000. From Chance Vaughan on the west and Tempco and other plants in Garland, the Texas Instruments plant in Oak Lawn and on the expressway, plants in Trinity Industrial District in Brook Hollow, the Ford plant on Grand Avenue, in South Dallas and East Dallas, and in the teeming central city, thousands of people drive multiple thousands of miles daily. This to and from work movement creates multiple police problems at peak periods. Only when accidents happen or a fire makes it necessary to reroute traffic do we realize the delicate balance between order and chaos maintained by a relatively few men in uniform who keep our vital traffic lifelines open and the wheels of industry turning. At nightfall, the tempo of business and industrial activity changes. Most of us are safely at home. Downtown, the streets become relatively quiet. Another police shift has taken over. Your night patrols are another assurance that tomorrow will again be normal. At home, you enjoy a quiet family dinner, watch your favorite TV programs, finally to bed, an undisturbed slumber. Your police protection goes on through the night. Protection for your home, your place of business, your central city. Storefronts filled with expensive merchandise might seem to present an open invitation to the criminal. He knows the seen or unseen patrol makes this venture extremely hazardous. You don't see steel protected storefronts and iron gratings in Dallas as in many major cities of the world. And the reason? A relatively few men ready for any emergency protect your city while you sleep. All this protection, its planning, its execution is far from simple. Your modern police officer must be trained. He must go to school. Dallas has one of the finest training programs in the nation. Even writing a traffic ticket properly requires a lot of know-how. If a ticket is improperly written, if a complaint is not in order, an officer's work has gone for naught. So the rookies go to school and the veterans come back periodically for refresher courses. A policeman must work smart. He must also be something of a lawyer. He must know the basic rules of evidence. He must often appear in court to testify about what happened. Dallas police protection necessarily has a nerve center, the dispatcher's office at headquarters. Here messages flash through in seconds to cope with emergencies. And coordination with two-way radio gets officers to the scene of action within minutes after a phone call. It may be a traffic accident, it may be a shooting. Whatever it is, the police are on the job. Whenever you see the flashing lights of a police car or an ambulance, you know that police officers are meeting emergencies, emergencies to you and I. But the sum total of our emergencies make up police routine. Strange as it may seem, a wailing siren that disturbs you in proportion to its nearness is an outward sign that men in uniform are working to maintain peace and quiet not only in these hospital zones, but over the entire metropolitan area. The sound fades in the distance. We forget it. We are not worried about the next emergency or community security. We take these things for granted. The police are on the job. Operation Dallas for community security never closes. Day or night, Sundays or holidays, winter or summer. Eternal vigilance is no catchword in Dallas police protection. It is standard operating procedure. We enjoy things of beauty. We are protected from the seamy side of life. We scarcely know it exists. We view the tranquil peace of a typical Sunday morning. People in all parts of Dallas going to and from worship. These are the outward manifestations of a peaceful city. These things exist and have their being because they are protected by a group of dedicated men working together with a system 
and a purpose. Community security is no simple problem in this growing city of Dallas that now includes 272 square miles and 680,000 people. Metropolitan police protection requires electronic equipment, high-speed vehicles, and scientific methods. More than that, community security depends on the courage and integrity of your police department from top to bottom. Dallas life goes on orderly and peacefully because your police department has these qualities. The buildings on the Dallas skyline are set in bedrock that came into being ages ago. The life that centers around that skyline exists under the protection of our laws, laws that have life and meaning because their enforcement is founded on the courage and integrity of the man behind the badge, the individual officer. His job is to protect you. Thank you.